Hey everyone, here's the big blue marble, which shows that our planet is unique because it has water in three forms. What are they? Well, you have the liquid water, which is pretty obvious. You can see the blue all over the place. You have water vapor, which is also pretty obvious, where you have a lot of uh, white clouds everywhere. And some more white down there at the South Pole, we can see uh, there's ice caps as well. So what we can see is that we've got lots of it, but is it all usable? Of all the water on Earth, looks like 97% is sitting in our oceans. We can't really drink that. Water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. So only 3% of the water is what we're actually drinking and consuming. Of that fresh water, you can see that two-thirds of it are sitting in the ice caps. 30% is sitting underneath us and the rest of it is on the surface. Um, but when you add this all together, it's not very much that's actually available for us to drink. So potable water is one of the biggest water shortages in the world. Since we know that there's water pretty much everywhere, how does it move? Well, we've got this little animation here showing you the process of water going from liquid into water vapor through evaporation. When it reaches up high in the atmosphere, it will condense. What does that mean? When water vapor gets cool, its molecules come closer together, it turns back to water again, and generally we see that in the form of clouds. So if it's a lower cloud, it's water vapor that's hovering there in the air. If it's really, really high in the air, it can actually freeze yep, into little be. ice crystals. Little ice crystals, like in cirrus clouds. So we've got precipitation is when the water just gets too dense and starts to fall. And the main thing we want to focus on now is instead of running off like we did last unit with the rivers and streams, now we want to focus on this infiltration. So the main thing here we want to know that all water always flows downhill from snow, rain, any form of precipitation, but the water that actually seeps into the ground infiltrates the ground and becomes part of groundwater. Yeah, and um, runoff rates will vary depending on what's on the surface, which means also the water seeping into the ground will vary depending on the surface. So vegetation can slow down water. It kind of allows it to sit there on the surface and then, um, depending on the soil composition, that water will seep into the ground um, at different rates. So another way of thinking of infiltration is thinking of the ground like a giant sponge. When the water cycle has the precipitation hit the surface, if the water is absorbed into the ground, it infiltrates and eventually works its way back to the ocean just a lot slower than we saw in rivers. Here we see a picture of something called the water table, basically. The water table is that area under the ground that fills up with water uh, because of the infiltration. So in this animation you, you can see that you know we've got precipitation hitting the surface, it's infiltrating through the ground, eventually hits that rock layer. What's so big about that rock layer? Well the rock layer is important uh, because if it is made of something that the water can't get through or can only moves through really slowly then it'll stop the water and the water will sit on top of it allowing us to be able to reach it. So if we want to change this water line, this water table you talked about, we can change our grain size here, and you can see with larger grains, there's not as much space, so that water can rise up higher. And if we have more precipitation, that's also going to increase that water line. Decrease the precipitation, we're going to get a lower water table. So like we said with particle size, porosity, or the percentage of open space between particles, really drives how much water can be trapped underground. When the water infiltrates the soil, it will get trapped on top of rock that won't allow it to pass through. The area that has water in it is called the zone of saturation, and the area above that that has air in it is called the zone of aeration. So you can see that here in the image here. Zoom in on this piece of soil there, and anything below that water table is completely saturated, completely filled, and anything above it might be filled with air. So that water table line is that separation between the saturated and unsaturated areas, and you can see that that water table line does match up with surface water. So like surface water in a lake, it's just that the land is dipped below that water table, and that gives you a pond or a lake. And when that groundwater and, and the water table is lower, you'll notice that the creeks and streams seem to run much lower as well. You guys say they're dried up. So the main thing that uh, restricts any of the flow of this water downhill is really, we said, the size and the spaces of the particles. A term that says how easy water can pass through is permeability. The ability to permeate and pass through 
a certain area. So you can see that different materials have different permeability. The pore space in them is going to dictate how quickly the water flows to the surface. You can see that gravel, which is, has a lot of space, allows water to pass through very quickly, all the way to clay, which has very little pore space and basically is impermeable, it takes about 200 years to flow one meter into the ground. We tend to not even think that it goes down. So if water is trapped on top of a clay layer, it pretty much will sit there rather than pass through any of these other layers. Close together particles will definitely limit and inhibit the flow and the ability for water to pass through. Right, and it might sit there actually trapped in one of those other types of rocks that we were talking about the water was passing through. So all that leads to where water is trapped underground, we call those regions aquifers. And the uh, areas that keep the water from passing through, we call those aquacludes. Turns out that you can't have an aquifer without an aquaclude. We now know that there's water underground. We know that we can access it if we need to. So now we need to see what that water can do to the layers underneath us in terms of erosion or deposition. And that's what we'll talk about next time. Next time.